Almighty, ever living God, who in Christ had been baptized in the river Jordan, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him, solemnly declared him your beloved Son. Grant that your children by adoption be born of water and the Holy Spirit may always be well pleasing to you. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Thus says the Lord, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one with whom I am pleased, upon whom I have put my spirit. He shall bring forth justice to the nations, not crying out, not shouting, not making his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he shall not break, and a smoldering wick he shall not quench. Until he establishes justice on the earth, the coastlands will wait for his teaching. I, the Lord, have called you for the victory of justice. I have grasped you by the hand. I formed you and set you as a covenant of the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out prisoners from confinement, and from the dungeon those who live in darkness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to Lord of all, what has happened all over Judea, 
beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The word of the Lord. When they cross, 
We know that they are no longer slaves to the Egyptians. They are able to properly worship God as they're called to worship Him. And then also what happens is they are brought into a land that is now their own. The land is that physical reminder of who they are. God has given them the land. They are God's people and He is their God. A constant reminder of who they are. We ask ourselves, who leads the Israelites? Most of us would answer, most people would answer, Moses is the one who leads the Israelites. However, Moses is simply an instrument, a tool of God. The proper answer of who leads the Israelites is God. Because God is the one who parts the Red Sea. God is the one who leads the people to, to safety. God is the one who leads the way. He does this again in the baptism of the Lord. God leads the way into the waters of baptism. For when we enter into the waters of baptism and, and are baptized using the Trinitarian formula, God removes the stain of original sin. So we're no longer slaves to sin, but we are given grace and we are able to live for Christ and for Christ alone. To prefer nothing above Christ, as we have talked about this weekend. We are able to call God our Father in the midst of the worshiping community. And we are able to do that because we become adopted sons and daughters of God our Father by virtue of our baptism, allowing us to properly worship God. And then finally, it leads us to a physical reminder of who we are. For the Israelites, the physical reminders, as I said, was the land. But for us, it is something much greater. The physical reminder that we receive, that we have, that reminds us of who we are, is the Eucharist. The physical reminder of the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ present to us under the form of bread and wine. Because the vir by virtue of our baptism, we are able to approach our Lord present to us in the Eucharist. And because we've received the sacrament of baptism, the sacrament of baptism is the gateway to the life of grace, and it's the gateway to the other sacraments. So baptism allows us to approach our Lord in the Eucharist and to say amen, that we believe that he's truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Shift a little to our theme from the weekend, a bit of a summation of the weekend. So if we were to sum up the virtue of religion as we spoke about this weekend, as St. Benedict proposes it, simply put, it would be God must always come first. That's the basis, that's the foundation for the virtue of religion. So putting God first allows us to love more perfectly a perfection, really, that can only be found in God. As we hear in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 8, My dear people, let us love one another, since love comes from God, and everyone who loves is begotten by God and knows God. Anyone who fails to love can never have known God, because God is love. So chapter 72 of the rule of St. Benedict says, Let them prefer nothing, whatever, to Christ. And may he lead us all together to life everlasting. To prefer nothing above Christ sets us firmly on that path which leads to heaven. To prefer something else sets us on the path that ultimately leads us to ruin. Jesus and only by Jesus and under his name and only by his name can we come to know salvation. So the wisdom of the rule in chapter 72 refer nothing whatever to Christ but that will lead us to everlasting life. This weekend one of the men that were praying that was praying for us sent me some beautiful words. I actually woke up to these this morning. And he said it to me to inspire me in the retreat, but I felt that they were so important that I wanted to share them with you. 
Both of these quotes come from St. Bonaventure, the great Franciscan theologian. If you learn everything except Christ, you learn nothing. If you learn nothing except Christ, you learn everything. And then a much, much longer quote from St. Bonaventure. If you would suffer with patience the adversities and miseries of this life, be a man of prayer. If you would obtain courage and strength to conquer the temptations of the enemy, be a man of prayer. If you would mortify your own will with all its inclinations and appetites, be a man of prayer. If you would know the wiles of Satan and unmask his deceits, be a man of prayer. If you would live and enjoy and walk pleasantly in the ways of penance, be a man of prayer. If you would banish from your soul the troublesome, troublesome flies of vain thoughts and cares, be a man of prayer. If you would nourish your soul with the very sap of devotion and keep it always full of good thoughts and good desires, be a man of prayer. If you would strengthen and keep up your courage in the ways of God, be a man of prayer. Finally, if you would uproot all vices from your soul and plant all virtues in their place, be a man of prayer. It is in prayer that we receive the unction and grace of the Holy Ghost who teaches all things. Beautiful words that come to us. Beautiful words that come to us from St. Bonaventure. As I said, St. Bonaventure is a great Franciscan um, theologian. And as we've done throughout this weekend, we take a look at certain saints and we allow them to be the icon of a particular virtue, a particular way of life, in order that we as Catholic men, men might imitate them, be an imitator of me as I am as Christ, as Christ, as St. Paul says. And somebody who truly strives to follow after our Lord in a very, very radical way, in a new way, was St. Francis of Assisi, the patron of our Holy Father. We know the story well of St. Francis. We know that he was born in the small village of Assisi in Umbria, the small mountain uh, village in, uh, in Assisi. We know that his father was a wealthy businessman. And his father wanted his son to be a businessman, but he wanted him to be a better businessman than he was. So he wanted something that was good for him even naming him uh, uh, Francesco, essentially meaning the French one. A Frenchman was a, a worldly man, a Frenchman was a, a good businessman, a Frenchman was somebody who could be wealthy. And so this is how he receives his, his name. But we know that in the life of St. Francis, trying to find all sorts of different careers, not a vocation, but all kinds of different careers, we know that he was, he was either met with failures or he was met with all sorts of dead, of dead ends. But it wasn't until two things in his life happened. First of all, he encounters a leper. And prior to this, if he were to see a leper, he would go the other way. The sight of the leper would make him nauseous. But here he does, he comes and encounters this leper and he embraces the leper, he kisses the leper. Because he understands the leper, the poorest of the poor, the one who had been ostracized from the community, he understood the leper to be his, his brother. Jesus says, you fed the hungry, you fed the thirsty, you could drink to the thirsty, you clothed the naked, you visit those who are sick or in prison. When you have done this, you have done this for me. When you have done all these things for the poorest of the poor, and St. Francis realizes at that moment that everyone is his brother, even, even the leper is his brother. And his life is transformed and changed forever. As he is meditating upon the beautiful San Damiano cross, he hears the words of our Lord, Francis, build my church. Francis, we build my church. Francis, taking it literally, literally rebuilds three churches. But in doing so, he realizes that the Lord is calling him to something much, much greater. And in his life, in preferring nothing above Christ, 
he realized that he was calling him to rebuild a church through the life that he lived. Not just simply a physical church, but through the life that he lived. And in the love, and in the poverty, and in the sacrifice that St. Francis showed, all were animated by Jesus Christ. And that love that he had for Jesus Christ through all these actions radiated throughout the world. Inspired people to do the very same thing. I want to follow Jesus in a radical way. This is what St. Francis shows us. This is a beautiful way in which he preferred nothing above the love of Christ. Brothers, as we prepare to return to our daily life, to our families, our work, whatever it is that we are going back to, let's continue to ride the wave of grace that we have received this weekend. Let's be like St. Francis, and let's continue to ride this wave of grace so that we can be eleven in our families, be eleven in our communities. And that leaven is animated and brought to fruition all through the love of Christ that we have. Again, preferring nothing above the love of Christ. So some practical things. If you've committed yourselves to change in attitudes and behaviors, do so by relying upon God's grace in order to fall through, follow through with a commitment. So if you've made this commitment, do so to follow through with the commitment by only relying upon God's grace. Because we know it's only through God in which we can truly uh, come to achieve the attitudes and behaviors that we want to change in our lives. As St. Paul would say, we do all things through Him who strengthens us. Commit yourselves to encounter the living Christ. Commit yourself to encounter the living Christ in the sacraments. And do so, I strongly encourage you, and I think even challenge you, to do so more than just once a week. Adoration. Try once a week for half an hour, and perhaps work your way up to a full hour. If you're doing this already, try adding another day. For when we come into the church and we enter into Eucharistic adoration, what we do is we have a guaranteed encounter with the living Christ. We know in that focus that Jesus Christ is present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. So what a great gift it is that we have. Daily Mass. If you're already there, great. Keep it up. If not, Again, try a daily Mass once a week. And if you find that it's to your liking, and I think that you will, then possibly go more than once a week. I give you these two examples of adoration and daily Mass, and the reason for that is these were the life changers for me. One Lent, I decided that I was going to go to daily Mass for Lent. I've never given that up back in 1990. I've never given that up. I know. And I remember one of those daily masses, I walked out of church, and I noticed there was a big sign-up board, and we all know when we're on fire with our faith, we're ready to put our name to anything, right? I had no idea what I was putting my name to, but I just was on fire about my faith. So I saw I had a time, and I saw where I was, I was supposed to show up to the chapel. So I remember that day, it was a Friday, I walked into the chapel, to make my hour not knowing what I was going to encounter or who I was going to encounter. And as I walked in the monstrance, there is a host. And at that moment, I knew who it was that I was encountering. I was encountering Jesus Christ. And for that hour, what I was doing was I was preferring nothing above Jesus Christ. So I give you that example again encouragement, words of encouragement, but also words of challenge. If you truly want to change your life, if you truly want to conform it uh, to the life of Christ, if you truly want to be like the great saints and imitate them inasmuch as they imitated Jesus Christ, then it means that how we live our life, we want to take it from an ordinary to 
to an extraordinary, from a natural to a supernatural. And we're able to do those things by relying upon God and His grace. And then finally, the relationship to these two things, celebration of the sacrifice of the Mass and Eucharistic adoration. Prayers are lifeline to God. St. Augustine says, in prayer, we are beggars before God. Think of the image of a beggar. We've all passed by a beggar. We've all seen what a beggar looks like. A beggar is a man who is putting his hand out to you, and he will take whatever it is that you can give him. Whatever it is that you can give him. In prayer, that should be our posture with God. Lord, I will take whatever it is that you can give me because I trust what you will give me is precisely what I need. So prayer is that lifeline to God, and we are beggars before God when we enter into prayer. For without it, it's like trying to drive a car without fuel. Eventually everything we know will come to a halt, and our wheels will be stuck, and we will go nowhere. Some beautiful words, I think, from St. Therese. Here we are in Carmelite uh, Monastery. And we spoke a little earlier about St. Martin, uh, St. Martin, uh, St. Louis Martin, uh, her, her saintly father. And these are words that hopefully inspire you and allow you to kind of reflect upon as you leave the uh, retreat today and hopefully perhaps chew over for the next day or so. St. Therese says, for me, Prayer means launching out from the heart toward God, a cry of grateful love from the crest of joy or through the, for the, through the trough of despair. It is a vast supernatural force that opens out my heart and binds me close to Jesus. She also says we must abandon the future into the hands of God. The beautiful act of, of trust in prayer, and is in prayer itself trust. And then finally she says, for me, prayer is a burst from my heart. It is a simple glance toward heaven, thrown toward heaven, a cry of thanksgiving and love in times of trial, as well as in times of joy. And those last few words, in times of trial or in times of joy, and we might even put next to that times of trial, times of temptation. The letter of James says, whenever we're tempted, whenever we experience a trial, he says that we are to count it as pure joy. Why would we count something like temptation as pure joy? We would count it only if we raise our hearts and our minds to our loving God. Because our loving God will give us the grace and He will allow us to come through the, the, the temptation, to avoid the temptation and allow us to grow in virtue, which is what we all want to do, allow us to grow in holiness. Obviously, a temptation is not something that comes from God, but a trial is something that comes from God. And again, James says, count it as pure joy, my brothers. And why would we count something as pure joy that God wants to give us that's a trial? Much of the world would say, just shy away from that. Something that we, we don't want to do. Or even perhaps as a man who said, I want to put my head down and I want to plow through that. But well, we count it as pure trial because it's something that our loving God gives to us. That if we embrace it and we rely upon His grace, what it will allow us is, is to become stronger. As gold or silver is passed through fire, and gold and silver is purified, it is made stronger. And that is the same with us. If, and only if, when we experience those trials, we, belong, we, we, we rely upon the grace of God. Whenever we experience any of these things, whenever we experience a temptation, whenever we experience trial, the difficulties in our lives, we simply need to cry out to the Lord. Last image. St. Peter, post-resurrection, saw our Lord, and he was calling him. They were out in the boat, he was calling them. And so St. Peter, as an act of faith and trust in the Lord, starts to go through, starts to go toward our Lord. And as he's going, he realizes that he's walking on the water, walking toward the Lord. 
not on his own, but this was a special gift that the Lord had given him. But as the scriptures say, things started to kick up around him. The waves kick up, and the water kicks up, and Peter, if you just imagine, he starts to look around at all these things. And he probably starts to say, how am I doing this? Here comes the wind, here comes the water, and it's in fear, and it grips him. And in doing so, what he does is he takes his sight or his focus off of the one who is allowing him to do this, the one who is calling him Jesus. And as the scriptures say, he immediately begins to sink. What does he do next? He does next what we should all do when we experience temptation and trial. He just cries out, Lord, save me. And as the scriptures say, Jesus immediately reaches down, grasps his hand, and pulls him back to safety. That's the lesson for all of us. That's the way of preferring nothing above Christ. To prefer nothing above the love of Christ. So as we are men who are committed to growing in holiness, men who are committed to be saints, let us remember those words, those words of St. Benedict, to prefer nothing above Christ at all times. Excellency, Most Reverend James Wall, and all the priests who minister here 
at the Sacred Heart Retreat House, that they may continue to boldly preach the gospel as he assists the faithful to grow in holiness. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who are sick or suffering loss in any way, that they may turn to Jesus, divine healer, so as to receive the strength and grace needed to persevere. Let us pray to the Lord. For those of us gathered at the holy sacrifice of the Mass, that through our encounter with Christ in word and sacrament, we may be filled with the fire of His love and bring that love to all those we encounter. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who have died, especially our past retreatants and retreat masters, that through our prayers and sacrifices for them, they may be welcomed into the heavenly kingdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord we pray, O Lord our God, that the Virgin Mary, who merited to bear God and man in your chaste womb, make men the prayers of your faithful in your sight, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join us in the offertory number 152, join the back. Number one, five, two.
He took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes of grace to heaven, he will God as Almighty Father. Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. Oh, no, no. 
that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ. Please join us with the communion chant on page 86.
nourished with these sacred gifts, we humbly entreat your mercy, O Lord, that faithfully listening to your only begotten Son, we may be your children in the name and in truth, through Christ our Lord. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.